Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, zum Begleitprogramm der Ausstellung Happy in Berlin, englische AutorInnen der 1920er und 1930er Jahre. Heute Abend ähm, soll es vor allen Dingen um Christopher Isherwood gehen und seine Berliner Jahre. Ähm, Christopher Isherwood widmen wir auch eine ganze immersive Soundinstallation hier im Haus im Literaturhaus Berlin. Kommen Sie vorbei und hören und schauen Sie selbst. Ähm, und auf unserer digitalen Bühne begrüße ich ganz herzlich den einen Kurator der Ausstellung, Stefano Evangelista, und Catherine Buckne, die Direktorin der Christopher Isherwood Foundation. Zwei ausgewiesene Isherwood-Experten, die uns heute ein wenig zu Christopher Isherwoods Werk, aber auch seinen Berliner Jahren erzählen werden. Wir freuen uns ganz besonders, die beiden hier begrüßen zu dürfen. Jetzt wünsche ich Ihnen viel Spaß und hoffe, Sie hier am Standort im Literaturs Berlin und auch an der HU im Grimm-Zentrum bald begrüßen zu dürfen. Good evening. My name is Stefan Evangelista and I am one of the curators of the exhibition Happy in Berlin. English writers in the 1920s and 1930s. Today, I am delighted to introduce to you Catherine Bucknell. Catherine is the editor of Christopher Isherwood's diaries, and she is currently writing a biography of Isherwood, simply titled Chris. Catherine, can you tell us who Christopher Isherwood is to you? Yes, hello. Um, Christopher Isherwood, uh, is an English writer who was born near Manchester in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, his father was an army officer. He came from uh, a rather upper middle class family. He was heir to an estate uh, outside Manchester. Uh, his father was killed in the war and the world into which he was born completely changed during his uh adolescence and in, he became a renegade from all of his uh patrimony went away to berlin in the uh in 1929 for the first time changed his life there and then went on eventually to california where he wrote for the movies which was a kind of childhood dream yes you told us he came to berlin in 1929 and that he came from a privileged background in England. What drove him to leave that background and come to the city? Well, as with all young people, there was a tangle with his mother, his surviving parents. So there was a lot of private rebellion. Uh, but really, uh, what he, he uh, was, as a very young uh, boy knew that he was more interested in uh, boys than girls as romantic partners and he struggled with that all through uh, school and university and in the uh, in the late 20s his good friend uh, W.H. Auden went off to Berlin uh, and came home with stories uh, about uh, the freedom there uh, the sexual freedom the boy bars and so on and Christopher uh, knew he had to go and uh, find out more about that. So you mentioned Auden being the first one to come to Berlin. Steven Spender is uh, another writer who is often um, you know, thought of as being very connected to the other two. And in fact, the three of them, Isherwood, Auden and Spender, are often thought of as almost representing a group, right? you know, writing together, uh, being very close to each other. And I think Berlin is the place that kind of uh, is seen traditionally as having kind of brought the three together. Can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship between these three writers and especially about their friendship really? Was it as uh, unproblematic as most people think? No, it, of course it was not. And, um, you know, Christopher Isherwood and W.H. Auden were very, very close. They went to what the English call uh, prep school together. It was a boarding school uh, where they met uh, when Christopher was 10 and Auden was eight and then and they were actually quite good friends at boarding school there's a diary left from that time with uh, uh of, of Christopher Isherwood's that that mm. talks about his um endless conversations with Auden when they were mm. little boys and they met again in 1925 by chance in London a, a friend brought Auden to tea at, at Isherwood's house um they were very close uh Isherwood wrote several times in later years in the 30s and again in the 70s about how they were two of a kind. Uh, they wrote plays together. Um, 
they were uh, they traveled to China together to write a book about the Sino-Japanese War in 1938. When when Isherwood first went out to Berlin, he went to join Auden. Auden showed him the city, took him to the Institute for Sexual Science, um, took him to the bars. It wasn't until 1928 that Isherwood met Spender, who was an undergraduate in Oxford, and you know, Auden introduced them. Uh, first, he showed Isherwood a story that Spender had written and sort of spiced up the, uh, the coming meeting. Mm -hmm. Isherwood and Spender became very, very close friends, but there was a terrific rivalry. Um, and Spender, um, I mean, Isherwood portrays him as, um, in some ways, a, a, a sort of uh, genius buffoon who, um, in, you know, often did the opposite of what made sense, was a terrible gossip and um, got himself repeatedly in life into tangles. You know, in the 50s, he, he, um, he, he uh, well, in, this, in, in 67, he was exposed as having uh, gotten involved in, uh, you know, running a magazine that was funded by the CIA, which everyone seemed to know it was funded by the CIA, CIA except for Spender. Uh, but what happened in, in uh, Germany in the uh, earlier uh, days, in the 30s, was that Spender was a bit of a tag along and came and uh, did everything Christopher was doing and then, and then went back to London and told everyone all about it, which really got up mm. Isherwood's mm. nose because mm. he was busily... Mm. It was his copy. Berlin was his copy. And mm. they mm. fell out. Uh, Spender had planned to introduce, uh, to d dedicate his first book of poems to, to Isherwood, and he decided not to. He later restored the dedication, but um, he, uh, Spender then uh, decided that other German cities would do just as well, and uh, went and um, spent time in Hamburg and other places. Uh, but they did remain lifelong friends, and this rivalry was, was a joke between them yes. as well. Yes, that's very interesting. And certainly, you know, they, they also wrote it about each other, right, in, in their writing. So it's a friendship that spills into, into the literature as well. I was interested uh, right now when you mentioned uh, um, Magnus Hirschfeld and his uh, Institute of Sexual Science. As uh, you probably know, in the exhibition, one of the things that we are trying to reconstruct is a series of places that were particularly important for English writers, places that become sort of uh, uh, hotspots in, in, in their network and, and the Institute was certainly one of them. Um, uh, we know that Isherwood, in fact, even lived in the um, next door to, 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 to Isherwood's institute. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Isherwood made of that kind of place, which is surely very much unlike what he would have been familiar with in England, right? Yes. Well, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. In his later work in the 1970s in Christopher and His Kind, when he talked much more openly about the sexual life in Berlin, he, he, he introduced the Institute as terrifically important. And he talked about how when he went there, he came for the first time face to face with his tribe. Um, he talked a little bit about uh, how uh, being gay had been um, something that he and his friends, uh, it was, it felt like a private clique to him. Hmm. And when he went to the, um, Institute, he, um, saw, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm, um, the bell is going. When he went to the Institute, he, um, saw this as something that was being scientifically studied. Um, and I think it was a great, um, it offered a kind of uh, strength uh, to him that any institution will offer. And in Isherwood's life, mm -hmm. generally, we see him often at the edge of an institutional life, never really joining in openly, but taking strength and knowledge from uh, the study and the academic aspect of the Institute. Mm -hmm. He said that, you know, Hirschfeld to him was a bit of, you know, a fuddy-duddy older man. There's a letter to his mother when he says, you know, the Tiergarten is like Hyde Park. He's trying to say to his mother, don't worry, I'm, I'm staying in a really, you know, nice neighborhood. A respectable um, right? <laughs> a respectable one, yes. And yeah. that there, there, there are people here with degrees, you know, doctor yeah. so-and-so. But he actually was incredibly interested in the um, underlife of the city. He was, he, he his explorations, um, were into the slums. He was interested in poverty, and I think he looked on um, the opportunity to penetrate to a, 
uh, a darker side of the city. Um, mm. For him, this was um, really important as a as a um, privileged, you know, um, upper middle class, super well educated boy. Mm. He wanted to uh, meet boys on the streets. He want he was really fascinated uh, by the by the figure of the boy young, vulnerable, alone, tested by the world. And we get it again and again in mm. Goodbye to Berlin and, and Mr. Norris Changes Trains. These mm. young boys who want to play a role in life, who don't have employment, who, you know, they want to be a character in the show. And they're pulled mm. to the city because it offers, it seems to offer wealth, opportunity. And it isn't just about uh, it, it's about getting your next meal, but it's also about having an identity, being somebody. Mm -hmm. um, he was really interested in those boys and he very um, deliberately went and lived um, with the family of one of his lovers, Walter Wolf, um, in Hallish Tor in a, in a slum tenement. And, you know, in his later writing, he dismissed this and says, oh, I only went for a month and I always could have afforded to move out. Mm -hmm. But I think for a young person of his background to do that was actually a stunning um, act and mm -hmm. um, and it produced some of his uh, really most um, revealing work. And when, when the Novaks was published in uh, New Writing in the in uh, 36, I mean, that was the thing that made him, I think, the most famous as, as a leftist. And he was really interested in, in the problems of, um, you yeah. know, of poverty and, and what to do about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's certainly one of the things that make his writings about Berlin ever so special, right? And quite different from what other English writers were reporting on at the time. The fact that he was able to penetrate into this working class world and he obviously used his uh, sexuality, as it were, right? You know, and his sexual connections in order, in order to get there. Um, you mentioned um, the importance of uh, clubs, of the um, countercultural scene, of the gay underworld, etc. What do we really know about what Isherwood did when he was here in terms of kind of uh, moving in that world? Where did he go? What did he do when he was here? Oh, <laughs> well, he, you know, I, I think the, the, the bar that has fascinated scholars is the one called the um, Cozy Corner. Um, yes, that's right. We also have a feature here. Cozy Corner, <laughs> Noster's uh, Hutta or something. It was um, um, near, n probably near Simeon Strasse, um, uh, near where he lived with Walter Wolf, and which I guess is disguised as the Alexander Casino. Um, he felt that it was, um, you know, the, the sort of fancier places which he uh, would go to around Nolendorf Strasse. Um, uh, were of great interest to him, but he felt that all foreigners went there to the to the glitter, glittery, better known cabarets. Uh, so he was interested in going to these um, more nameless places. And he had a friend, a British archaeologist called Francis Turville Peter, uh, from a similar background to his, except that he was Catholic, um, who was a rather brilliant archaeologist, um, uh, famous as a very young man, but uh, troubles with he was an alcoholic really and um he was being treated by magnus hirschfeld for syphilis and that's how isherwood um decided to live at the institute i mean he'd been there with auden but francis turville peter was living next door to the institute in this annex that hirschfeld's sister had uh because he was being treated for syphilis and he often had to stay in bed for the day and he would take um isherwood off to bars um, and the two of them, according to Isherwood's later account, were really interested in the whole kind of anthropological aspect mm. of the boy world. So, you know, he, he later, he, he later criticized his youthful behavior as very, um, exploitative, that it was all based on this transactional, like I'm the rich foreigner and I have money and the boys are hungry. But I think there was a genuine interest um, in who they were, how they lived and how this world functioned. And there are letters, uh, you know, from the period uh, in which he talks quite a lot about the boys and um, how to befriend them and interact with them and uh, also, you know, what things cost. Hmm. I think it's important 
for um, to introduce uh, something else about his his sort of study of what it meant to be gay. Um, you know, he read all the literature, starting with you know Oscar Wilde and so forth, um, uh, pretty young. When Auden went to Berlin, he met a man called John Layard, who was the patient of an American psychologist called Homer Lane. And these two, along with perhaps D.H. Lawrence, were kind of preaching um, what Isher would call the gospel of um, the devil is conscious control. You'll be ill if you don't give in to your um, sexual needs and explore them and grow through them. Um, so although you've got this public and institutional uh, Hirschfeld studying and, you know, a pretty well-known public figure in Berlin and, in, uh, and you know, working to change the penal code, uh, attending court cases to testify on this and that, protecting all sorts, I mean, you know, people know, I, I guess, about the, the Institute, but there was also this private um, uh, pilgrimage that Auden and Isherwood were on to try to understand who they were, uh, what they were, how they were made. And um, so some of it was through these private friendships. Uh, John Homer Lane was dead already. So John Layard was the only conduit for information about, you know, Lane's uh, theories about um, growing through, um, uh, you know, emancipating yourself by doing what you needed to do, following your urges. And they, you know, they were reading Freud and saying, well, Freud's a bit of a square and, um, you know, we need to, uh, D.H. Lawrence taught issue with the importance of touch and the actual, you know, physical uh, acting on what, what you had only imagined. So Isherwood and Auden both incredibly powerful imaginations. And when they got away from England and away from their um, social circle, people who knew them, they were related to, you know, so many people that they socialized with. They didn't want to embarrass their families. Yeah. And in Berlin, it was as if imagination and theory uh, could be acted on and could become real. Mm. That's uh, fascinating. It's fascinating, this idea of the city where, you know, you can realize yourself in a way that you couldn't possibly do in England, right? I mean, the, the, the other thing that seems to me very important here is the political context. You know, we've already mentioned, you've already talked about some of these boys and the way that, you know, their um, situation of poverty puts them in a position of vulnerability, etc. But there's also the incredible volatility of Berlin politics at the time, you know, very much split between the right and the left, etc. Ishabut seems to me to have kind of dip his feet into this or was it a little bit more than that? Well, he was um, very much inclined to the left um, and he later um, insisted, well, he never joined the Communist Party and he later insisted that his commitment to the left was confused and, um, and rather ignorant. He had a very close friend, Edward Upward, who uh, was a very committed communist and who came out and visited him in Berlin several times, once um, on the return from a tour of Russia where he saw, you know, the farms, the schools, the projects that were going on uh, post-revolution and was very excited and inspired by that. Um, I think for Isherwood, the whole... Um, he, uh, Isherwood also worked for um, Willy Munzenberg and the... Um, you know, he did translating work for uh, mm -hmm. essentially a communist front. Uh, Munzenberg, you know, is sometimes called the red millionaire. I mean, he didn't have any money of his own, but I've discovered in my researches that he too had an apartment uh, in Hirschfeld's sister's annex. And um, all sorts of people were running into one another in the hallways there. Uh, so, you know, as to how Isherwood first made the connection, it's unclear, but um, they, they, may, they may have run into each other literally in the hallways of the, of the mm -hmm. Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So he did do that translating work. He did read all the books. You know, he read his Marx, he read his Lenin, um, and he believed with his generation uh, that the communists were going to change the world. Mm. Uh, he was not um, uh, 
I, it took him a long time, uh, and he portrays this, I think, very um, convincingly in Goodbye to Berlin. To you know, people thought the workers uh, were the heart, were, were going to were going to win. That they they were the heart of the city. They were the pulse. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, he wrote about um, the Nazi rise after it had already succeeded. And what I mm. think he tried to show is that um, the comedy and the clownishness and the um, impossible, like how could people so crude or um, unpolished um, take over? And I don't want to offend anyone's political convictions now, but I think there's a, there was a remarkable matchup mm. with what we saw with you know Trump, who seemed to be kind of never in control of what was taking place and somehow had this genius for um, getting his way. I, I think this is one of the things to really in, enjoy in, um, in Goodbye to Berlin is just the brilliance with which he shows that um, uh, it just didn't seem possible for this group um, to mm. win. But the more they were made fun of and the more they were laughed at, mm. uh, the more savage the uh the anger and mm -hmm. um that is shown with a kind of um slow hypnotic pace yes. that uh, i mean reading it now it's it's just incredibly frightening yes. uh and yes. very understated yes but um very yes. realistic yes i mean it's interesting you you're talking about the the texture as it were and the style of um, of isherwood's novels i think it's uh, important to remind um people like you just did that these are retrospectively written works for the most part right you know this is this, 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 this these are works that he wrote after he'd come come back to britain and he immortalized a time that was already and the city in a way that already did not exist anymore because the Nazis had already taken over and that kind of liberal and slightly chaotic Berlin that he had loved so much and already by that point effectively disappeared. I mean, one of the fascinating things about um, Isherwood's novels is precisely that relationship to his own autobiography, right? You know, that desire that drives, you know, Isherwood readers to say, okay, so this is the place where Isherwood went. These are the people that he knew. And that obviously stems from the fact that he fictionalized real people there. For example, you have uh, Jean Ross, you know, the, 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 the English kind of uh, bohemian artist who was, yeah, who's turned into Sally Bowles. You have Gerald Hamilton, who is turned into Mr. Norris, etc. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Isherwood manipulates his own autobiography? You know, his narrator in Goodbye to Berlin is called Christopher, like himself, right? You know, what, what, how does he use his experience um, of being here? How does he turn it into fiction? Well, um, I think, you know, he kept diaries. And so when we say he wrote retrospectively, we should also try to remember that he was using diaries that he was writing on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, observations he made as to what was actually taking place um, often then appear in something that he writes later um, with very, very tiny changes um, in order to make a particular impression. Um, and each of those characters that you've named um, are, you know, said and known to be the models for uh, the characters in the books, each of the real people that you've mentioned. And yet it's um, each of them also has many other <laughs> um, mm. exemplars, both in literature and in real life. And we see him blending into his Gene Ross character. For example, I believe a, a little girl he knew when he was only eight years old um, is very much uh, brought back to life in the, in the, in the Sally Bowles figure, um, as well as, you know, figures from literature, you know, and perhaps um, from cinema as well. For example, um, uh, you know, Pandora's box, uh, he went to see in Berlin, and certainly that um, Louise Brooks uh, completely captivated him, and that androgynous kind of look. Mm. You know, we see some of that in the Sally Bowles mm. uh, character. And what he's doing is going for um, 
you know, a combination of things, maximum entertainment, but also there's always a moral intention. And he worried that Mr. Norris, the Gerald Hamilton book, Mr. Norris Changes Trains was so entertaining and people laughed so much that they didn't see the critics uh, quite how worried he was about uh, the fascist rise. And, you know, it's possible to see in the Mr. Norris character also a kind of Hitler figure who is tricking people and pulling the wool over their eyes. And there's a lovely bit near the end where he just, you know, it's a sort of kaleidoscope effect. He only has to tweak a tiny bit. And he had this gift for generalizing from a particular example, um, you know, what oft was thought, but ne'er so well expressed. I mean, it seems like he's grabbing it out of thin air, but he read constantly. He went mm -hmm. to the movies constantly mm -hmm. and he was blending, you know, many, many things with his own personal observation. So it was very tied to a specific mm -hmm. time and place and also rooted in a long kind of canon of um, mm -hmm. similar figures. Mm -hmm. And this gave, um, weight and vitality uh, mm. to what he uh, wrote in what is really fiction and mm. uh, based on based on real experience. Mm. That's a tricky game to play, isn't it, to a certain extent? Do, did the people who, who were immortalized, who were kind of caught in this game, did they ever get back to Isherwood? Did they ever feel upset that they, that they had been manipulated oh, yeah. and turned into characters? Oh, yeah. I mean, he went to a lot of trouble to ask people's permission. Gerald Hamilton, who loved attention, um, you know, dined out on it for the rest of his life. He, <laughs> he took on the character. Uh, Jean Ross, who was um, a fairly serious journalist, and uh, she lived with Claude Coburn for a long time and um, had a child with him. She did not like uh, some of how she was portrayed in Sally Bowles. I mean, he... he he pursued her for her permission. The big question at the original time of publication was, can I write a story in which a character, obviously based on you, has an abortion, which is based on truth. And at the mm. time that was beyond scandalous, it was illegal, it was dangerous and so mm. forth. And so her hesitation, uh, she told him he could publish it. John Lehman was all set to publish it in new writing. Then she took her permission back. Then she gave it again after all. And so it was originally published as a very small book mm. by Leonard and Virginia Woolf at, at the mm. Hogarth Press. Um, but what upset her later on was a perception of the Sally Bowles figure as an anti-Semite -Semi mm. because mm. she talks about the Jewish producers who want to sleep with her. Yeah. She's, you know, wants to get on the stage. She'll do anything. And, um, um, you know, he, he used that very uh, uh, broadly in the book, and it, I think she felt it stuck to her, and it wasn't mm. language that she personally would ever use. Mm. But I'd just like to say that Christopher Isherwood knew uh, what it was like to be a subject in someone else's book. It happened to him a lot. Mm. It happened to him when he was remarkably young. He was um, already... Um, used by a friend and neighbor uh, of his family in Cheshire as a character in a book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it upset him and then it made him very tough. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he did always get permissions from, from his friends. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like if anyone's had the personal experience of, say, being quoted in the newspaper, uh, the first time it happens, you everyone says, well, well that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So talking about newspapers, I'm thinking actually about that little snippet from, is it 1952, from when Isherwood comes back to Berlin for the only time, I believe, after his stay in um, around 1930. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why? Did he come back? And why did he not want to come back again after that? The um, uh, Goodbye to Berlin was made into a play, I Am a Camera, which was a huge hit on Broadway in uh, the autumn of 51. And the um, Christopher had Christopher Isherwood had been writing uh, about American literature for The Observer in London. 
uh, he was by then, you know, settled in California. He'd been back to England once or twice after the war. And um, the Observer commissioned him to go to Berlin and rediscover uh, his life there. Hmm. Uh, he was um, thinking that he wanted to go. And then um, suddenly he fell down the stairs and nearly broke his leg. He had all sorts of digestive issues. Um, he had to see a bunch of doctors. And he realized that he really uh, unconsciously did not want to go back to Berlin. Um, it's a really complicated and fascinating situation. I think it was very painful for him to leave in 1933. And he had um, probably invested a huge amount of psychic energy and then, you know, dealing with that. Um, so going back um, uh, w was... Um, was complicated. I, I mean, I think he feared to see the destruction, uh, even in 1952. Um, as far as I understand, there were still no trees in the Tiergarten. They'd all been used for firewood and, you know, everything was, was bombed and uh, they were only just beginning to rebuild some things. Um, and then there was Heinz Nettermeyer, his boyfriend of... Um, uh, of, of this later part of his time in Berlin. Um, and this was the boyfriend who he took away with him in 1933 when, when, they, when he had to flee, he took his boyfriend to Greece and then tried to get him into England. Um, there were passport issues. I mean, everyone was trying to get passports. Uh, lo lots of Germans were. Um, Heinz was never able to get uh, a new passport. And um, he and Isher would traveled all around Europe and this was a, a torture and um, agony, a source of gigantic anxiety. They hired a shady law lawyer to help them. They tried to bribe people. And in 1937, um, running out of uh, you know, short-term permits to stay, Heinz went from Luxembourg to uh, back into Germany at Trier to, um, to get a promised um, hmm. visa and was arrested by the Gestapo. Hmm. Uh, he went to jail. He uh, served uh, hard labor, and then he went into the army. He incredibly survived the war. He was um, a prisoner of war uh, in an American camp in France when 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 the war finally ended. And he wrote to Isherwood a postcard that took, you know, like a year to reach him. Um, when Isherwood went back in 1952, he did not write in that newspaper article that he saw more than anything else. He spent time with Heinz and met Heinz's family. Mm -hmm. Heinz was married and had a son who by then was um, 12 years old, I think. Mm -hmm. He went over to their apartment in East Germany. He, mm -hmm. um, Heinz came out to, um, uh, to the West Side. They went to um, see Isherwood's old landlady at 17 mm -hmm. Nolendorf Strasse, mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, Meta Thurau, who was the, um, who was the, the landlady in Goodbye to Berlin. Um, and actually, I think it turned out to be a very um, rewarding and important mm -hmm. uh, return to Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, but it exposed um, a lot of fears and anxieties and suffering. I mean, Isherwood was a great one for saying that, for always saying he was fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But studying his life uh, over the last 10 years, I mean, he definitely suffered from anxiety, panic mm -hmm. attacks, depression. He had a couple of mini breakdowns. Mm -hmm. He coped with all these things mm -hmm. um, pretty well, but he was often um, just a complete invalid mm -hmm. in bed. He had mm -hmm. unbelievable psychosomatic mm -hmm. um, uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. That's so, interesting. Um, I don't know if that answers your, is that, does that answer your Yeah, question? yeah, no, it certainly does. I mean, it certainly gives the sense of how conflicted in a way his relationship to Berlin is. And in a way he's, um, you know, you know, it gives me the impression of his post-Berlin time as a double act of trying to remember, but also try to destroy or suppress or repress or rewrite experiences here, which brings me to the question of the diaries, right? Which is always something that I'm really kind of keen to know more about. He says, he destroyed his Berlin diaries. Obviously, we believe him. 
um, you know more about Isherwood's diaries than anyone else, right? You know, and if I'm right, these are the only diaries that he kept that he actually destroyed. Why did he do that? Um, well, I, first of all, they're not the only ones he destroyed, as uh -huh. far as I know. Okay. Um, uh, but as I, I mentioned earlier, he always is trying to his his pu his public statement about why he um, destroyed them was that he was worried in his crossing back and forth to the United States that carrying papers that somehow um, diaries with sexual detail could get him into trouble, and there is no question that um, when Heinz Nettermeyer was arrested at Trier, you know there was a trial. Isherwood was named as the um, person with whom Nettermeyer had committed reciprocal mm. onanism in, and I can't remember how many countries, mm. Mm. he certainly couldn't go back to Germany after that. Uh, mm. That's one of the reasons he never visited mm. Nettermeyer. Um, he was, he was, you know, a criminal persona non grata. Mm. Um, so he said the reason he destroyed the diaries is that they had um, uh, sexual detail in them, which was mm. dangerous. Mm. But I, I believe, in addition to that, that he had a, he had told his story in a particular way. That was the version that he wished to survive. I mean, he later said he preferred his own, the past he'd created, to the real past. Um, and I think one of the difficulties he had with Spender in later years, you know, um, Christopher. Um, in the Landauers, uh, Natalia Landauer is, is, is partly based on a, a friend called Gisa Solovaychik. And Spender said, well, she wasn't really like that. Mm. And Isherwood, you know, it's mm. really hard if you're trying to make something up and one of your best friends is saying, but that isn't historically accurate. So th it's really important to understand that Isherwood was a writer of fiction and he mm. was incredibly close to the border mm. of mm true documented history mm -hmm. but he studied history at school and university mm -hmm. he knew what history was mm -hmm. and he was not trying to write history he was trying to write something new and something mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. and i think he had um it was part of his power and part of his magic mm -hmm. um that he needed to then um get rid of um the documentation mm -hmm. now later on uh later on he saved everything so mm. he he went he visited his mother in 1947 he visited his mother um at his childhood home wiversley his mother had saved first in their house in london and then carrying in suitcases to all of the places she fled to uh, escape bombing in england during the war she carried all the papers that survived in england and in 1947, when he went back to Wibbersley, where he was born, he sat and went through all of it. <laughs> Some of it he then burned in the stove at Wibbersley. <laughs> I think that by then he had already burned the Berlin diaries that all of us would love would to read. Love to have. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think he had burned them before, but he burned a lot more stuff at Wibbersley yeah. in 1947. But he very deliberately saved uh, material that he subsequently used in the book called yeah. Down There on a Visit, um, yes. which has uh, the story Ambrose, which is about just after he left Berlin, he went yeah. to Greece with Heinz yeah. Nettermeyer and stayed with Francis Turbel Peter. Yes. So, so he, he saved um, some things from the late 30s. Yes. Um, that's fascinating. We're, we're, we're almost running out of time. Um, I oh. just want to ask you, no, 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 that's fine. No, 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 we're, we're kind of engrossed in the tales here, right? You know, but I just want to ask you one final question, which is to do with, with fame, right? You know, and with cabaret and with, you know, it's probably the first thing that people who don't know Isherwood know about Isherwood. It's something that he didn't himself write, etc. cetera. Um, Goodbye to Berlin had a second life, you could almost say, with cabarets in the 1970s. It's a very different time, right? The 1970s. Berlin is changing. Berlin is again becoming a cool city at the time. It has, again, an alternative scene, etc. How did Isherwood react to that? You know, did he, was he, did he like Cabaret? Did he think that this new attention towards his work was detracting from the kind of things that he was writing then? What happened then? 
Well, I, I think he was of two minds. Um, part of him was really bothered uh, right from the beginning with John Van Druten's play, I Am a Camera. I mean, he helped to write the play. He worked with Van Druten quite a lot. Um, the man who played him on stage in New York, I think, was a pale, uh, wan ghost of any Christopher Isherwood character. So having your life taken over by a lot of brilliant talent um, is an uncomfortable thing. And I think he spent a lot of his later career trying to um, get his personality back mm -hmm. or even to say he'd ever had one because um, the, the narrator that he created was very deliberately a bland narrator in order not to distract from the other characters mm -hmm. and for other reasons as well. But um, this was not really him. And it, it was represented as him. When, when Cabaret, the film, came out, I mean, when, when I Am a Camera came out, Julie Harris as Sally Bowles, to him, she became Sally Bowles more so than anything he could ever remember. He was 100% in love with Julie Harris as Sally Bowles. He, was, he, loved, he loved that. And he sometimes said that after she'd done it, he couldn't really remember what actually happened. He just saw her in the role. Uh, with Liza Minnelli, um, it was harder for him. She is a very tall and, you know, she has this incredible voice. So Sally Bowles really wasn't supposed to be a great singer. No. Um, nevertheless, he sat and watched the Academy Awards in 1972, I think it was, by which time, you know, Liza Minnelli was a superstar. She was on Time Magazine cover and Newsweek cover at the same time, the first person in the world ever to be on both covers at the same time dressed as Sally Bowles. And of course she was Judy Garland's daughter. So that was even, you know, added to it. He um, came to like her um, and he was thrilled at all the prizes and awards that, um, that the movie won. He never went to see the musical on Broadway. His mm -hmm. friends kind of warned him, but what he didn't like was the portrayal of the character who kept being renamed, you know, Bradshaw, then Clifford, mm. then Brian. I mean, um, mm. he didn't like this vague sexuality, mm. bisexual, straight, but mm. no real uh, libido. Who mm. was this guy? Um, mm. And I think he kind of still resented the world in which that was how you portrayed such a character. Mm. Mm. So, you know, I would have loved to have um, mm seen him at Alan Cummings, um, you know, cabaret, because nowadays it can all be done differently. Yes. Um, yes. Well, okay. Thank you very much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Um, there's so much more that we could say about Isherwood, obviously, right? And then about his connection to Berlin at the time and afterwards. But, you know, we certainly have your book to look forward to, to read, <laughs> to read more about that. So a book entitled Chris, we look forward to that coming out soon. Catherine oh, thank Bucknell, you. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed for talking to us today. It's been a pleasure talking really to you. Really fun to talk to you and good luck with the exhibition. Thank you very much. Just one final thing, the catalogue for the exhibition Happy in Berlin can be ordered online if you so wish. Otherwise, come to the exhibition and get your copy here and visit the exhibition as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>